cold, wet, and raining, snowing in London at the moment, and the light level is so low, I always feel like one of those little animals that's come out of a hole, and there's beautiful light level over here. I'm going to talk, um, or take you on a little bit of a journey. I'm going to talk about products from the smallest of products to the very biggest in the world. Um, I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about how the disciplines of design are just falling apart. I think they're, they're almost going. Some industries are disappearing, and some are emerging. And also talking about how we're being asked to do more and more interesting things and moving into other territories. I, uh, when I first graduated from the Royal College of Arts, quite a few years ago now, I always was, wanted to work in the large arena, the large arena of big projects. And um, the way I did that, I, I decided to set up a consultancy. And to do that, you have to delegate. You have to empower people. So I set up a company which could do some of these very big projects. And the end game was for me to be able to then move back into doing what I love, which I'm passionate about, is about design. But quite interestingly, along the way, I got a bit distracted and got really interested in business. And um, I'll take you a little bit on the, on the story of this. This is actually a, a little photograph of um, a, a windowsill in my studio. It's a little studio I've built down on the coast in the south of England, separate from the London studio. And this studio is for me. It's for me to think in and to get back to designing. I always find that if you're designing and the phone goes and you, and, uh, you have to talk about a financial aspect, your brain flips and you can stop, stop you thinking creatively. So this is an area where I can think. At the moment, I'm really into wedges. They're chocks. Some people call them chocks. These are things I found on the beach outside my studio, just along the front of it. And what I think is interesting about these is that they're one of the oldest tools of man. I mean, the Egyptians used these, but they're still used every day. Also, what I love about these objects is that they're, they're worn. They've been used before. They're very natural. I love the fact that they've almost looked like they've been played with before, before I picked them off the beach. And I think that is one of my main principles of design. Things have to look natural. I don't like forced objects. I don't like imposing superficial style onto objects. It's to do with things looking natural. I'm also really interested in multiples of things as well. I think this came about from looking at factories, seeing buckets of things in factories. Because um, I've always been interested in mass production and things that really do affect people's lives. This is a photograph, um, again, in the studio. And these are of um, some propellers I bought in Thailand. And they came from uh, the longfish, the, the boats that go up and down the canals. Uh, long tails, I think they're called. Um, but what's interesting is the materials and the finishes, and also the, the beautiful shapes. And I think when you take things out of context and look at them in isolation, they're very beautiful. So talking about multiples, this is a photograph of um, a product I designed quite a few years ago now, which is a radiator. This is sitting in a factory. And it's become a very successful product, particularly in America. It's a radiator. It's a thing that heats your house. It's about a, a meter tall. And um, I don't know whether everyone knows how radiators work, but a few years ago, well, 100 years ago, someone had this idea of heating houses by pumping water around a building. It's quite a strange way of doing it. And they pump hot water around buildings, and they pump them into heat exchangers, radiators that sit in rooms, and they give off heat. And radiators are, are simply that. They're heat exchangers. They, they transfer the heat from the water into the air. So what you need is a lot of surface area. And radiators, um, I think, are very boring. And um, they also, they're manufactured, tubular radiators are manufactured by cutting lots of straight lengths of tube, welding them together, assembling them. It's quite a time-consuming process. It's um, something that uses a lot of energy. And um, this idea came to me of taking a continual length of tube and coiling it on a con computer-controlled machine, which actually coiled the, the tube into a spiral. And then the back of the tube is then bent down the back, and it creates a solid object. It's actually a very heat-efficient heat exchanger. But also, it looks very natural. A lot of people say about this, well, it wasn't designed. It just, well, it just happened. And I think that's um, a great compliment. I take that as a great compliment. Back to multiples. These are rulers that I bought in, uh, in uh, Tokyo. Um, just nice graphics, lovely materials, but again, multiples. And I think the, the finishes and textures of these are, are wonderful. And I move on to some technology. Uh, a link from technology, from rulers to technology. This is a little object which um, we designed a, a few years ago. And um, I've got one in my pocket here. I'll just demonstrate how it works. That's, um, what it is, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a keyboard which um, 
projects a laser QWERTY keyboard in front of it. And then when you um, move your fingers um, over, the, uh, over the area in front of it, it actually registers where your fingers are. And then Bluetooth, it radios the information to whatever object, whatever object you want. It's, a, it's an amazingly clever piece of technology. <laughs> but what's interesting about this technology is that um, the switch is actually, the, the areas of switching actually is floating in space. It's actually two millimeters above the surface of the, of the surface of the, uh, whatever you're putting it on. And um, what I find fascinating, apart from this being a standalone little peripheral, is that this is sort of liberating humans from switches because they're actually vir virtual switches in space. And just like in the films, you'll be able to liberate from, from the, the clunky switches which surround us, you know, look everywhere. There are switches everywhere. They dominate humans' lives. So when these things start to, this technology takes off, we can move it away into other areas. Think about um, applications for in the medical industry where QWERTY keyboards get horribly filthy and dirty. And you can clean this because you can wipe it clean. When you pick it up, it just switches off. But the design of this thing is um, completely nothing because you don't look at this. It's a, it's a monolithic little object. And um, it's designed specifically for that. The other interesting thing about the project is that um, it, it's an example of complete worldwide working. So we designed and engineered this in London. The technology actually originated from Israel. It was heavily invested um, by a, a Hong Kong firm, Hutchison. It was manufactured in China, and it was target, or the target market was the USA. And this was done very quickly. It was designed and engineered probably in about three months, which is quick in industrial design terms. I'm staying with small products, and I'll get bigger as they, as they go on. This is um, a mobile phone which we recently designed for the Italian market. And this, again, is a, an example of quick turnaround, uh, an object unlike radiators, which lasts probably in the marketplace only about six months. Um, this originated from um, Hong Kong, where we had a, a phone call from the owner of Hutchison saying he had just ordered a million phones to be manufactured in Taiwan at $100 each, and he wanted us to design it. Uh, the problem was he wanted us to design it in about four weeks. So we did some sketch work, and then we sent a team over to work in Taiwan, and this is the object. This is an example of high disposability objects that have quick turnaround, and it's classic product design, which is originally where I originated from, is, is my design area. But as you see, that's moved on. The one feature that uh, on this, which I have an absolute, uh, it's one of my um, real bugbears of life, is that I hate the hinges on flip phones. I think they're just so awful, and we were able to do something about that. So back to a shot again at the studio, sitting um, peacefully thinking about design. And this is uh, just a piece of driftwood, which um, obviously found on the beach. But again, this is um, looking at accident, looking at um, things that come together and create things. So this is two bits of wood, which actually create a seat. But also, you can see someone's been drilling on it in the past life. And it's become something quite, uh, quite beautiful, I think, quite natural looking, weathered. And talking about natural and thinking, and really thinking deep, this is a very simple um, product, which we were asked to design. It's a knife block. I'm sure lots of people have knife blocks sitting in their kitchens. So it's a, normally a piece of wood to store knives in. We were asked to design a knife block and in amongst an, a number of very big, um, well, a, a range of, of um, kitchenware products. And this particular item, we thought, well, what on earth can you do with a knife block? It's just a, you know, it's a thing for putting knives in. And we thought about it and thought about it. And then we suddenly thought, can you clean inside the slots of your knife block? You know, these are things you have to think about as a designer. You know, what's living at the bottom of the slot of your knife block? You can't get in there. You know, what lives in there? So we started to think this about this a little bit more, and, and um, it came up with this idea of actually holding two bits of wood together with magnets. And the idea is that you can pop these apart, and then you can clean all the surfaces easily, wipe it clean, and then snap it back together again. And this is what um, uh, came about as the design. And what, once more, with, the, with this design, you can... It's made from an extrusion of wood. So it's like a continual length, which is swapped around and creates the product. So there's two identical pieces which are put together to create the product. And hopefully, um, it creates a nice looking product at the same time. This has become a quite a successful product. And, and what is interesting, it's sort of changed the market in knife blocks so that now people are going into shops saying, well, I want a knife block I can clean. So it's quite interesting how design can actually influence that. 
This, again, is a very simple product, the last simple product. And this is um, a device for opening cans. And I, I'm showing this because I think it's quite, it's quite amusing, is that here we are. Um, I was asked to design a, a product, to open a product, which should have been designed correctly in the first place. You wouldn't need a product to open it. Um, so we, we, um, the other thing I thought about this is that if you have tools, I have a drawer at home in the kitchen, and it's just full of tools. I don't know what they do. They're just like lots of different objects. So I thought, wouldn't it be great if this object looked like the thing it did? So this is like a large campel, and it's called campel. And on the serious side, it's very good for people who have arthritis, a bad mobility of the hands, and also for perhaps the elderly and firm. But this has become a, a, a great selling product. Um, we've just designed another one. Um, which is for the Japanese market. And interestingly, that's actually 25% smaller because uh, people in Japan have slightly smaller hands than, than us over here. I've always been interested in transportation. This is actually a picture of a skateboard I bought in Paris. Uh, talking about transportation, um, we were asked to um, design some trains for a company called Virgin. And it was one of the first transportation projects we did. Um, we've been working on the project about eight years. and. Um, when Richard Branson briefed us on the project, who's the owner of Virgin, he said he wanted to encourage people to get out of, the, out of their cars and that he wanted them, we wanted to bring back the romance of travel. And this is an advertisement I'll show you, which is showing at the moment in the UK. It's magic. What is it? It was like a great dragon tearing ride. Better than the hotel. I can probably keep the menu as a souvenir. Uh, a pot of tea for two, please. Make absolutely sure that the water is really boiling. Certainly, madam. The moment I meet an attractive woman, I have to start pretending I've no desire to make love to her. What makes you think you have to conceal it? How do they walk in these things? Huh? Will you quit stalling? We're going to miss the train. The project involved the design of all of the exterior of two types of train, um, the high-speed Pendolino, this train, and this particular train, which is the cross-country train. It was a part of a 2.2 billion pound investment in the rail transport system in the UK, the biggest ever. Um, and they've just started uh, finishing delivering the final trains now. In the UK, the, um, the, the actual trains themselves are run by franchises like Virgin, but the tracks are owned um, independently, which makes an interesting mix um, of, of uh, transportation chaos in some cases. But what we were trying to do here is to embody the, the Virgin brand, which is where the word brand starts to creep into what I'm saying, is the idea of trying to create something which is unique to a particular company. And it was the first time that, we, that the trains had been designed for the UK, which designed for specific markets. Normally, there's a standard vehicle that is just rolled out um, across the network. And here we have one train designed for high-speed commuter routes, which competes with aircraft, because trains are competing with, air, co are competing with aircraft in a big way in Europe now. And then one which is designed for more for families, holidays, mums and kids. And what we tried to do with a brand such as Virgin is to try and create some, some fun something which is a little bit unusual in public transport, character even, shock horror in public transport, and um, to get something which is people can enjoy. But also the challenge is to, to allow these to also um, solve and, and, and satisfy all the very rigorous safety aspects of a vehicles like this, all of the disability access, thinking about disabled people, blind people, infirm people. And um, I'm always disappointed to see in public transport where you, you obviously see someone who's designed a train and then suddenly thought about some of the, someone with, with bad eyesight and they put everything in bright colors and um, it doesn't have to be like that and, and it's just the quality of thinking. Um, and I think we, we managed to move the, move the game in, in, uh, in transportation design in, in trains and um, hopefully raise the standards. I mean, these projects, you know, when I say I or we, um, these projects involve hundreds of people on these projects. There's not a designer sitting in a studio uh, by the South Coast designing these things. This is um, hundreds of people coordinating and run, running uh, different departments all over the world to try and create these, these very big projects. 
and as I say, lasting for many, for many, many years. For instance, the seats here, you can see these were um, manufactured um, in France, and we had a team working down there in the factory working with them uh, to deliver these. We talk about um, uh, branded environments and branded moving environments. And on the train, these are the cups and saucers, knives and forks. Um, these are all designed by ourselves, but it's to do with a completely controlled environment, um, something which has fun and is controlled. The other interesting thing about designing trains is that when we designed this nose quite a few years ago now, um, if we'd made that look like the latest Ferrari, then when it came out, five years later, it would look out of date. So this is another aspect of designing on these projects. You have to think so far ahead. Most of the projects, and well, 99% of my time at the moment is involved in a project for 2012, and um, totally secret until then. I'm not allowed to talk about it. But as a designer, you have to think, well, you don't want to be too distracted about what's happening around you. Um, you need to think ahead. This is a photograph of the, the studio in London. We have about 25 designers core design team, designers from all over the world. We've kept it small, um, and we collaborate. That's the way we've managed to keep it so small. And we use some of the best people in the world to work with, whether they're textile designers or engineers, ergonomists, whatever. And we collaborate to create some of the biggest projects. This project is quite a big project. Um, this is for Airbus. This is the uh, double-decker uh, Super Jumbo, as it's called. And I don't know whether anyone from Airbus has managed to make it down from Toulouse. But, um, they, they were going to come down and have a, uh, have a listen to what I was going to say. So <laughs> um, this is a very large aircraft, a beautiful aircraft. And um, this is actually at the launch. I was invited down to the launch last year, this time last year, where all the heads of state saw the aircraft for the first time. This is a side shot. You can see, actually, next to the wheels, um, those are people along the bottom. And if you look very carefully, there's actually a wedge as well by the wheel there. <laughs> but, uh, but, but it's a big aeroplane. The diameter of this engine is actually the same diameter as uh, Airbus A319, the fuselage, if that makes any sense. It's a big aeroplane. But, uh. <laughs> but we won the contract to design the front section of this aircraft, the interior of it, or the concept interior for this. And that's from a, basically just the door above the A of the A380 forward. What's interesting about this project is a totally tapering section, so there are no vertical walls. Um, and um, we designed and built this interior. And this is a film that Airbus shot of the interior. I'll um, stop it there. But <laughs> it's, um, uh, it goes on a little bit, uh, a bit longer, this one. But um, this is um, just taking you through the project. This is before we started the project. This is sitting in a, a hangar in the south of France, in Toulouse. And um, this is uh, in the, the main deck, looking towards the rear of the section of the aeroplane before the tailplane's put on. Um, you can see a smaller aircraft to the door on the left there. And the brief from Airbus was to design the future of aviation. And the, the purpose of this mock-up is to sell aeroplanes to the airlines around the world. So when we won the contract, um, in, the, in this particular sector, we, we're used to pitching for all of the work that we do, often against about nine or 10 different companies. And companies such as Airbus or the airlines will pick designers from all over the world, which we compete to win these contracts. So this is the, the brief. When we won the contract, we designed it. And then we built a replica of the front section of the aircraft in the UK. Um, and then as we designed all the bits, we fit them to this framework to check it all fits together. 
and then take it all apart again and reassemble it in the aircraft itself in Toulouse, in the south of France. This is on the main deck, the upper deck, looking towards the rear end of the aircraft again, to the pressure bulkhead. This is a big hemisphere that sits within the tailplane of aeroplanes to keep the aircraft pressurized and um, stop it exploding, I suppose. And um, this is, you can see some of the shapes and forms of, the, of the, uh, in the interior. And again, what we're doing here, this is an aircraft which is going to be running for about 20 years. So we're having to think ahead. We're not thinking about things which are now. We're thinking about things of the future. And it has to have a sort of timelessness. So there is one aspect of designing aircraft which is called the cabin lining. It's the bits that go around the outside, the windows and the ceilings, which will never change in the life of an aircraft. And then there are all the bits inside, which actually then can be updated. This is one of the bar areas. It's a big aeroplane. In this particular mock-up, it's got bars, restaurants, libraries, showers. Um, it's, a, it's a massive aeroplane. Yeah. This is just one of the, the details. Often you'll see in, 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 in the work that I'm showing is that the curves actually um, appearing in the, in the interiors of these aircraft. And um, you might think they look a bit curvy, but when you actually see aircraft at the nose, everything is curved. There isn't a straight line in it, so you can't start imposing things. In imposing straight lines. And also, um, space is an absolute priority. So we're always thinking about trying to fit around the human form. This is one of the bathrooms and showers. So going back to a shot of the studio. We've been working a lot in the aviation industry. Um, and we're doing a lot of work on the A380. So we did a concept for the A380, the Super Jumbo. And we're now de delivering two um, A380s for different airlines. They're called serial builds. These are the ones that actually go into production. And one of the companies which we're working for is the biggest airline in the world, and that's Lufthansa. And we've been involved with Lufthansa for about six years, and we've been rebranding Lufthansa through the product design of all of their seats and all of their bits and pieces that go inside their aircraft. We talk, call it a, a passenger journey from home to destination. And what's interesting here is that me as a product designer, here we are rebranding companies. And I think branding has moved on from um, painting vans and tailplanes and graphics on letterheads into some tangible benefits. People want to see a benefit when they rebrand. And that's exactly what Lufthansa has been doing with their particular push on, on, on the design of the seats, which we've been doing for them. And these are the shots actually used in their advertising campaigns at present to promote their brand. And they're all of the designs of the seats that we've been carrying out for them. And what we're doing here is trying to build up a product language which becomes their identity. That's their ownership. And this stops other people moving into that territory. It's protected. It's highly, um, it's highly skilled in the way that, that they use this to actually protect and then move on from, from where they are. The other interesting thing is that uh, Lufthansa is a German um, national carrier, the German national carrier. And here they are using uh, UK designers. And I think that is a reflection. They're using design as a strategic tool to actually move their brand away from being overtly Germanic into something which is more international. This is just um, some of the details on the aircraft we're working through at the moment. Again, it's always very frustrating talking about design of aircraft because the projects we're doing at the moment are, are um, way down the line, but we're not able to talk about them for a number of years. I was going to talk now uh, just very quickly about a, um, another product, which is um, a very different. It's an example of, of, um, of, a, of a different airline that we've worked for. And I'm, I'm just going to show you a clip of, a, of an animation that we've done for them. Um, it's, a, it's a new first class for, for an airline, um, but it's completely computer generated. And this is sort of the level that we have to achieve now. But this seat, when you, when you look at this interior, which is to do with, with marketing a, a new product to a uh, Far Eastern business upper class market. So it's designed to, to meet a different need.
You take the sound down. I'll um, carry on talking. If you take the sound right down, or maybe leave it in the background. Um, as I say, this is designed for um, uh, the uh, Far Eastern market. Um, but it's this, this is actually on a 747 main deck, front section, again, tapering section. And the things that we're able to do with this is it's got completely new cabin lining. As I was saying earlier, this is unusual. So it's like an executive jet. But the brief from Malaysia was they wanted to be a five-star airline. They wanted to be better than Singapore. So this was the project, and this was the brief. This was launched um, late last year, and they got their five-star award um, earlier this year, which they're very pleased about. But this is um, just an interesting area of design where we're trying to work with companies to try and embody something which is almost a nationalistic sort of feel. So the shapes, the forms, the colors um, are all very much their own. And we work with a big team to do this. As again, it's a very different area from someone sitting in a studio working with some helpers. This is the bathroom. Bathrooms on airplanes are absolutely appalling. We've been working hard to get these sorted out. And um, here we're working in, in um, looking at, at getting them improved, cleanliness, all of those sorts of things. Again, these projects last for three or four years. Just some still shots of that. So taking it on, taking the story further. So we started as products, little, little bits of plastic, and moving into aviation. We've been, now been moving into fixed objects. And this is a, a project that we've recently started in, in hotels. And interestingly enough, um, we've now started working heavily in hotels. And this particular project was um, a company called Yotel had this idea of doing a micro, um, a micro hotel with rooms which only have 10 meters for each person in the room. And um, they came along and had a chat with us and asked us to work on the, uh, on the project. And um, the idea was to have these little pods with no windows in them um, sitting in, uh, in large spaces, cramming people in. And I started to think about this a little bit more. And uh, the one thing that I, I felt really bad about was not having a window, claustrophobia, all that sort of thing. And I, I think hotels are really badly designed. Um, the, the, the corridors, these wide corridors, are wasted space. They're dead space. So the idea with the hotel concept, the windows actually face onto the corridor. So that instead of having rooms with corridors, you have cabins and aisles. And then outside every room, you have little seats. You have little things which you can then start to use the corridors in different ways. And this, if you have a group of people traveling together, I, I've always had it, the, 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 the uh, uh, experience of checking into a hotel with some people. And um, you all go to your different rooms, then you have to pick up the phone to find out what, what everyone's doing that night. So the idea is that people can check into this hotel. They can actually have a group of cabins together. You can then start to divide the corridors in ways that you then have these little communities, these little, little villages, little chalets. So it's a different way. It's a more communal living. Also, if you're working on your computer, why not leave the door open? Why do you need to close the door? Um, I think things are moving on in that area. This just shows the size. It's a very small room. And it's pulling on a lot of our experience in the aviation industry. So the bed goes from a sofa single bed into a double bed. It's got a full shower. But it's also a totally controlled environment. Everything in this environment is designed. You don't have a standard light or a painting you've seen before. It's everything is designed. It's a controlled experience and a fun experience. I don't think you necessarily have to stick decoration everywhere to make it fun. It infuriates me if I go to a boutique hotel. It um, looks great, but you can't read in bed, or the light doesn't work, or you can't switch on the tap in the shower. It's crazy. That's not good design. Design is to do with, with providing the right service, but also having fun and uh, serviceability. The other thing that I, I have a pet hate is that I never use wardrobes in hotels. You know, why are the wardrobes? You're staying overnight. You never put anything in them. because You think you're going to forget about them. So um, the idea here is that all the wardrobes are actually just indented panels in the walls. And this also allows you to then incorporate lighting into these panels. So we're thinking about mass production, thinking about ease of production. And we're treating it like a big product. We even thought right the way through to all the details in the showers. Everything is bespoke, and it's all designed for mass production. And here you can see some of the detailing in the shower. Um, we even came up with different ways of actually producing the, the, the tiles to make them feel more handmade, but actually in a mass-produced way. So 
moving on from hotels, now I, can, I can't show you anything we're doing at the moment because <laughs> it's all top secret. <laughs> and I was trying to find a, a, a lovely picture of, a, of one of the biggest cruise ships which we're working on at the moment, but I wasn't able to show you that. Um, so from, from plastics through to aviation transportation, we're now working in some of the even bigger products, which is cruise ships. It's a fascinating area, which um, does bring us back to chocks and wedges because actually ships are held up by these objects. Um, but um, it, I find it fascinating the way that, that things have just moved on in, in this way and um, that we're working on, on, on bigger objects. And people are asking us to work in, in areas that I never thought that we'd be wanting to work in, which poses a problem for, for, for my company because um, the reason they come to us is because we're not interior designers or product designers or branders or graphic designers. We're, we're, we are product designers. Um, and um, so we can't move into those areas, so we, we have to stay as product designers. But it's an interesting dilemma. And finishing off with the, the last shot from this uh, studio on the south coast, um, place to think. Um, you know, I'd just like to finish on the note that, that you know, whether you're working on the simplest, smallest of objects or the most complicated, the most complex machines man can make, you still need time to think because thinking is what it's about. You have to learn, you have to think, you have to listen. Um, and just the quality, the quality time of thinking is what, what is needed to create great design. Thank you very much.